think we should start. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming uh, everyone, of course, uh, the speakers at this webinar, uh, but also everyone who is joining the conversation. Um, it's a webinar on uh, which crisis and whose evidence uh, about robust and inclusive evidence for rep rapid outbreak guidance. And it's a co-hosted event. Um, the Athena Institute has uh, set up a series of webinars under the heading of transdisciplinary responses to a global crisis. And with transdisciplinarity, we mean two things. One of them is transcending disciplinary boundaries. Uh, so not just bringing together different scientific disciplines, but also bringing together societal actors in developing knowledge around this uh, challenge. But also transdisciplinarity in the sense of being transformation oriented. So trying to do research that contributes to the kind of changes that we think may be uh, needed. Uh, and for that, of course, we collaborate very much with all kinds of uh, people in their different fields. So it makes a lot of sense that we're co-hosting this event uh, with the uh, Aid Knowledge Working Group of GIN. Um, that's a working group on appraising and including different knowledge in guideline development. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really glad that we can do this together because this is the types of questions that uh, I don't think any scientific institution or unit in itself can be discussing. So exactly the the, the gin format is a very good place to have this uh, conversation. Um, so, um, we have a series of webinars last week. This, this is one in the cluster of uh, knowledge systems. Uh, last week, uh, Linda van der Burgwal and colleagues spoke about uh, accelerating R&D responses during outbreaks uh, of emerging infectious diseases. How do you deal with the rapid sharing of R&D knowledge? Uh, in the light also of protecting uh, intellectual property rights, things like that. Today, we're going to be focusing on the part of the knowledge system that deals with evidence appraisal. Of course, a very critical uh, system right now. Um, and uh, what we're uh, hoping to do is uh, in the beginning of the webinar, I'll give a brief overview of sort of where I think we may be in terms of this is, this is where we are uh, is with COVID-19, is our knowledge system for appraising evidence, is it in crisis? Some people claim it may be, so maybe it's not just a health crisis, but a knowledge appraisal crisis. But if that system is one in crisis, it's also good to pay brief attention to its historical roots. Why did the system of evidence appraisal became the way it has become? Um, and what are some of the main challenges that that produces right now? Because it's too easy to say there's problems in the current system without also showing why it has what it was a solution to. Um, and then uh, the, I want to say something about existing alternatives for appraising, appraising and including wide ranging types of knowledge in the absence of randomized clinical trials derived evidence or meta review derived evidence uh, based on some work that's been done by people in the Aid Knowledge Working Group, um, which relates to ways of scientific reasoning, different styles of scientific reasoning, but also uh, different quality appraisal tools for different types of knowledge. And then I think we come to the more interesting part, uh, which is the part of where we may be going. Um, what might we be able to learn from current developments, if anything, for the future of EBM? Uh, and we'll be focusing on two things. One is uh, I'll present some preliminary results from a rapid survey that we did amongst members of GIN um, and how they are experiencing uh, the current uh, needs in they face in guidance development. Uh, and we will be discussing three, I think, very interesting uh, practices by three speakers who are currently working at the front line uh, of uh, uh, working with COVID-19 guidance. Uh, Frode Forland uh, from the perspective of a public health institute, Sietse uh, Wieringa from the perspective of a guideline researcher who's working at the uh, clinical uh, encounter and Thomas Tesseroglu uh, from the perspective of a, a policy evidence interface uh, uh, making. And of course, I hope many people will be joining the conversation. Uh, it's always a bit hard to get the interaction really going. So one of the things that I thought, if you want, if you have questions coming up during the session, maybe already type them in a like a note thing or something, don't make them excessively long, but already type them so you can quickly paste them into the chat at the end. Um, let's see how that works. So to sketch very briefly where I think we may be, um, uh, the 
dominant approach of uh, evidence-based guideline development and the current challenge that's being faced for rapid outbreak guidance um, is 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 quite different. Uh, there's and it's good to to have a, a sense of what those differences might be. In evidence-based guideline development, good knowledge has mostly been defined as knowledge that has a high internal validity and that has linear causality. This may be very obvious to some, but I'm still wanted to go through it uh, briefly uh, to bring everyone up to speed, different people joining this conversation. But so internal validity and linear causality has been very important in evidence-based guideline development, but is not what we currently have at hand uh, when trying to develop guidance in rapid uh, at, at high pace for, for this outbreak. What you then much more need is something that has high ecological validity. The difference being, of course, like does, the, does this uh, effect we found or this finding, what are the chances that it also will really will play out like that in the complex setting of a complex adaptive system? The kinds of values are quite different uh, in these two approaches. Uh, in evidence-based guideline development, there's a strong focus on high statistical confidence, which is very understandable because it also comes from a concern about keeping out conflict of interest. And we'll be seeing in some of the talks also today that this is a real issue. Um, and uh, in outbreak guidance, the most important thing is to have as good as possible guidance at a high pace. You can't afford to wait for that high statistical confidence to emerge if it would be possible. Um, the infrastructures are quite different. Uh, I'll be saying a few things about the uh, evidence hierarchy, but that is central in most practices of uh, evidence-based guideline development. Whereas for rapid outbreak guidance, you need a much more hybrid arrangement of evidence. You need quality appraisal tools. You need experts who are able to connect those uh, new types of knowledge to what is going on at the, at the clinical front line or at the policy front line. Um, and there's also a difference in how problematic it is to exclude certain actors or certain knowledges. In evidence-based guideline development, mostly this has been seen as a kind of collateral damage, but you, you cannot get your high statistical confidence and your very strong linear causality if you don't also exclude certain things. So you have to just not let some kind of things enter, or you can let certain types of knowledge enter later in the considered judgment phase. Um, for rapid outbreak guidance, that works quite differently. If you exclude certain actors or certain knowledges, uh, that might put your entire effectiveness of your intervention at risk. I think the most illustrative example of that is the uh, lockdowns that were imposed in India, um, which uh, were, taking, were not taking into account uh, the knowledge about what this would mean for people who don't have a roof above their heads and who don't have food for the next day, but only for this day. And of course, if you then impose a lockdown, uh, what you actually produce uh, is an exodus that puts everybody at a higher risk. So these kind of knowledge inclusions become even more important uh, in uh, rapid outbreak guidance. And what does that leave us? According to Trish Greenhog, who's always good for some uh, uh, conversation and discussion, uh, she asked the question whether evidence-based medicine is actually going to survive COVID-19 recently in the Boston Review. Um, she stated that it's, you know, no doubt that EBM has uh, offered uh, powerful insights, but the principles have been naively and indiscriminately overapplied in the current pandemic. Let's see about that. Let's return to that. So is this the end of a dominant approach? It's also good to pay brief attention, as I said, to why that dominant approach became dominant. Uh, for that, it's good to keep in mind that in the early 70s, 1973, first time, uh, the Dartmouth atlases were published, which showed that there was a huge variety, uh, a huge variation in the type of treatment you would receive depending on the county you were in or the hospital you would go to, but irrespective of any clinical factors. Um, and the range was really very wide and it led to the uh, idea that variation is one of the big problems that needs to be fought, um, especially variation that cannot be clinically explained. That was very central in the rise of evidence-based medicine, combined with concerns that actually there may be, the way this played out may be connected to vested interests. 
of both medical professionals, but also, of course, pharmaceutical companies who were trying to influence these medical professionals. Um, so the question around what actually happened in 1992 with the introduction of evidence-based medicine is uh, a bit mixed. The question whether at that point the hierarchy of evidence introduced can be answered in different ways. Um, in 1996, Dave Sackett and colleagues tried to clarify that really uh, EBM was not about randomized trials and meta-analysis, and they actually listed a number of uh, types of questions for which the RCTs are not best. Um, but at the same time, if you look at the infrastructures that have been developed for EBM uh, guidance appraisal, actually you will find many versions of this hierarchy of evidence in which RCTs or meta-reviews of RCTs are on top. So I think this uh, sort of attempt at repairing things has been more preached and practiced perhaps. Um, and uh, one of the things we did initially with the Acknowledge Working Group, uh, and um, this was work that was done by uh, Fergus Macbeth, who you will hear later, was to actually look at, well, what do we currently need uh, for guidance development, even in non-outbreak settings? Uh, actually, you need lots of different types of knowledge, and we wrote an opinion piece, uh, and Fergus and myself, uh, about uh, that, that helped found this uh, working group. So another part of why uh, that hierarchy of evidence has become so important was, uh, and this was other work we did with the working group, was um, because of the rise of statistics as a dominant solution to certain types of problems, namely the problem of induction. And with statistics came the focus on frequency-based reasoning. Um, and frequency-based reasoning means, is, is generally the, the problem of induction means, in philosophical terms, means even if you've seen something happen 50 times, you don't know if it's going to go the same the next time. That's not a problem you can solve philosophically. Uh, so there's different ways to evade that problem. And one of the ways to evade it is, of course, a frequentist way, uh, which assumes the idea that if, although we can predict the future for the individual case, we can be usually right, as long as the events or the cases are frequent enough. Um, there's a few problems with that, and keep in mind the COVID outbreak. Um, first of all, it assumes that reality is dice-like, that you roll the same dice all the time, over and over, and then you know what's going to come out the next time. Um, I think the realities we'll be hearing about later on in this webinar will not sound dice-like. It's also uh, assuming that there are simple uh, causal correlations independent of context. Of course, this is very unlikely in the COVID-19 outbreak setting. We're dealing with widely varying contexts in which different measures as packages of interventions are needing to have a, a, a result. And of course, this also poses fundamental limitations when inferring in the single case scenario. And in a way, an outbreak of a new disease, although it's happening in many places at the same time, is a single case scenario uh, in the sense that uh, this has not happened before in this, in this sense. So in this study, we also looked at other types of reasoning to evade the problem of uh, induction. And there we list a few that uh, could be relevant also for this conversation. For example, for, for example, uh, Bayesian evasion, uh, which is also uh, statistics based, but includes uh, time and experience and uh, learning along the way into the statistics. Um, uh, for example, uh, another good example, I think, is mechanistic or deterministic reasoning, where you look more at the entities and activities that are organized in such a way that they're responsible for a certain phenomenon. That also means if you understand the mechanism of something happening in one place, you might be able to translate it to another setting. So we wanted to highlight that there are different ways to think about good knowledge than only the frequentist-based uh, one, and these ways may apply better in some of the things we're facing right now. Of course, in addition to uh, different uh, styles of reasoning, what you also need is different quality appraisal tools. If knowledge is different and you need different styles of reasoning, you also need different quality appraisal tools for different study designs. So in this uh, project that included a, a number of people involved in aid knowledge, but was led uh, strongly and inspiringly by the Robert Koch Institute um, and uh, 
Thomas Harder and all the Wigman were leading that study. And I think Anya Takla did most of the work for this. They, they, we identified, uh, I think, 26 types of uh, study designs and 21 uh, quality appraisal tools. And um, we then uh, tabulated those to show uh, the kind of quality appraisal tools that you might want to use in, the the, in, in a certain type of knowledge so that you don't start to apply the wrong stick to the uh, one type of knowledge. So where may we be going uh, from here? This is sort of where I think we may be. There's many other things that can be added to this, many people working on this type of uh, problem. But what might we be able to learn from current guidance developments for the future of uh, EBM? Um, to return to uh, Trish Greenhawk, um, her claim uh, in this uh, uh, editorial or, op or opinion piece was that the inadequacy of the prevailing par paradigm has become mission critical. Um, and indeed, she hypothesizes uh, evidence-based medicine will be one of the more unlikely casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, now, of course, uh, of, of course, this is, this is uh, typically uh, Greenock's expert opinion, maybe also the opinion, uh, or maybe quite an opinionated expert as well, uh, always good for some discussion. But we also wanted to test uh, to what extent this may actually be the case. Uh, so we did this rapid survey on COVID-19 guidance production, and these are the very preliminary results. Julia Reimann, uh, one of our uh, global health uh, research master students has just uh, carried it out together with Marilyn Moleman, one of our PhD students at the Athena Institute, uh, together with the Aid Knowledge Group. So one of the questions we asked is, uh, do you continue to use the standardized methodology that you uh, usually use? This survey was sent out amongst all the members of, uh, of GIN. Uh, it wasn't a huge response, we had 80 uh, responses um, and that was unsurprising given how busy people are, but I think it does give some kind of an indication. Um, and uh, to this question, uh, are your standardized methodologies fitting for the job you now need to do? 80% of the GIN members say they're not. We cannot keep using the methods that we usually use, which, is quite telling. We looked a bit at the kind of things they say. We're still analyzing this. So, uh, but some of the things, of course, you know, th there's a high need for speed. We need to work with consensus groups, which used to be a central part of um, guidance development, but it's become much less uh, central. Um, wards require best responses, not waiting for perfect answers. Um, we have to think outside the RCT box, etc. And one of the few people who said we do keep using what we use is someone who says, well, we need to have an emphasis on good, on good clinical practice guidelines rather than rapid. Of course, the question is, in this time, is it even still good if it's not also rapid? That's, the, that's part of the puzzle. Um, we also asked on what kind of sources are you currently basing your COVID-19 related guidance? Um, the two things that are most striking in this is that expert opinion is much higher than uh, I not only was expecting, but also we still have to do the exact comparison, but also than it was in the survey we did eight years ago. But also that editorials have come up and this was not a category we uh, listed. So this is a new category in evidence production, the use of editorials which is not so much part of the, uh, of the standard approaches and which of course is slightly complicated as well, because that means you bring in not only experts, but also eminence. Um, so, uh, uh, but this is an interesting finding, we thought. We also asked, what are your current greatest challenges for appraising knowledge in COVID-19 guidance? Um, and of course, things like lack of knowledge, uh, uh, limited evidence, etc. but also things like experts are busy. You have an additional problem, that is that Expert opinion, of course, may become more central at a time like this, but your experts are also probably working at the front line and are extremely busy. Um, balancing rigor and speed, things like that, uh, the fact that guidance get outdated very quickly. When asking people what's most helpful uh, in meeting these challenges, uh, they mentioned things like working with consensus groups, emphasis on expert opinion, uh, but also uh, being pragmatic, having a pragmatic approach, um, 
and uh, focusing on cooperation, including international collaboration and finding each other quickly, um, being able to help each other out with these kind of guidance questions. So then the question about whether we may be facing a system change or not. Is this an outlier case? Is this the exception? And is everybody go, gonna go back to their previous practices of guideline development as soon as they can? Um, who knows how long that will take? Um, so we asked them, uh, do you think this is going to change the methods for regular guideline development in future? And actually, I think what's striking here is not just that 44% says, yes, this is gonna change how we do our work, but is that only 30% uh, of the respondents says, uh, no, this is, we're going to go back to what we did. And this has been built over decades. This is decades of investment. Um, so I do think there is, th this is quite an indicative uh, change and we still have to follow this up with the follow-up interviews and also in more extensive survey. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, there uh, people uh, raise these kind of things away from the lengthy process, um, uh, importance of patient values. That's certainly one we want to follow up uh, in, in our interviews as well. Uh, the, the need for speed, uh, uh, things like that. And of course, also people who say, well, other than grade is not accepted or, or validated. So of course we will go back to that as soon as we can. So are we at the end of EBM? Uh, I doubt it, but maybe we may be at more like a, rather than a crisis, we may be at a moment of catharsis, uh, including possibly some of the purifying effects uh, uh, of it. And I think that was put quite nicely by the comments of one of the people in this, uh, in this survey said, you know, I think we have, we're, we're having to compromise and accept that we cannot follow our usual detailed and lengthy processes but having those existing processes has enabled us to identify and include the vital steps to ensure robustness and quality of the COVID guidelines. And having experienced staff who are working flexibly, using their experience where it's most needed, staff has been redeployed and are working outside their usual roles. And what I think is quite interesting here is that mix of, you need to have your procedures in place, you need to have all kinds of things up and running, you need to have good quality appraisal tools and all these things, and then you need a lot of flexibility and a lot of people yeah, being able to work very professionally. Right, um, now we, uh, this is, as I said, these are preliminary findings, but I think they're indicative of something that may be happening. Um, and we now come to the part I myself look most forward to, uh, which is questions about how this kind of rapid outbreak guidance is currently done uh, in practice. Um, as I said, we have uh, three speakers and uh, uh, discussant. Uh, Frode Forland, who is the Director of Infectious Diseases and Global Health at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, also a former GIN trustee and one of the founding members of Aid Knowledge, uh, and who is currently very uh, active in developing guidance from a public health institute. Sietse Wieringa, uh, guideline researcher at the University of Oxford, but also COVID-19 ward medical professional, member of Aid Knowledge, uh, and also really able to speak to guidance at the clinical encounter. Um, and Tom Ristisaroglu, uh, a lecturer of global health systems at Athena Institute and also involved in guidance 19 production in guidance production in, in Turkey, COVID-19 guidance production in Turkey. Uh, and that is mostly at sort of the policy interface. So I think that's a very nice sort of way in which we discuss different parts of that evidence production and use chain. And then uh, Fergus Macbeth has kindly agreed uh, to give some comments and reflections. Uh, former director of uh, guideline development at NICE, former GIN trustees, and a member of Aid Knowledge, including one of the founding members. And then, of course, I hope there's some time for questions by all of you. Um, save your questions. We'll be taking them in the chat uh, later on, I think, or if you want to uh, put them in, of course, you can do it. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen and give the floor to you, Fraude. Thank you, Ten, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Goedemiddag, uh, Amsterdam. Uh, nice to, uh, to be in this call. Uh, let me try then to share my screen. Is that the first uh, thing we should manage here? Let's see if that comes up, does it? Uh, and yes. then uh, I'll give it uh, one more click. Uh, this will be a talk from a very practical point of view. 
uh, I'm in the midst of uh, coordinating and running the business of the Norwegian Institute and uh, serving our country when it comes to managing this COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And it's, it's been a really challenging and really also, I think, a fascinating way of discussing both professional issues together with practical problems. And this is really a time when science and practice comes together. And I'll give you a little a shot first of how we've see the, seen the, the outbreak and the situation in Norway. And then uh, as well, give you some reflections on how we can work with our old methods of evidence-based medicine or adapt them in, in this current situation. So that's the plan. The mission of the Norwegian Institute of Public Health is actually to produce, summarize and communicate knowledge uh, uh, to the, uh, what can you say, to the world uh, or to the country mostly. But we are also taking part globally where we have a national responsibility or national competence. <clears throat> Our key areas of work, as for many public health institutes, is connected to knowledge, preparedness and infrastructure. Uh, the slides are coming up nicely, is it Tim? Yeah, that's good. So for knowledge, we do research ourselves, we, anal we do analysis of data, we run surveillance systems and we do literature reviews and systematic reviews. And in Norway, we are in this lucky situation that the Knowledge Center for Norway, the Cochrane Center in Norway is part of our National Institute for Public Health. So we make guidelines for infectious diseases, but not for the other sectors of, of healthcare. That is Directorate of Health doing. For the preparedness, we are doing ongoing services and activities 24 seven for preparedness labs and also for infection prevention and control with a phone for all doctors, communication, and we're also the focal point of the international health regulations, which is obliging all countries to have such a report system uh, being prepared also for the response when there is an outbreak of diseases crossing borders. And related to infrastructures, we have surveillance systems with all these registries named there. I don't need to explain them. And we're a reference lab for 30 bacteria and viruses in Norway. We keep a biobank and also registries for, for the labs. So this ends up in recommendations, guidelines, advice, information, publication, communication, different ways of communicating our messages across. And then here's another pyramid. And this is not an evidence pyramid. This is a disease pyramid. So uh, just relax, there will be no evidence pyramid here, but we see at the bottom of this, there are something written in red. And that's uh, those things we still don't know about COVID-19. How many are exposed? How many are infected without having symptoms? And those are having symptoms without going to the doctor and displaying it somewhere. So we're trying then to collect data, as you see on the right side, with the sources of data, with different types of registry and data collection measures or, or uh, uh, samples or uh, studies on the right side and then we come to those who have been in touch with their GP they are known in a way and we register in what we call the, the disease pulse which is the registry for primary care physicians in Norway then we have those who have taken a positive test they are even ending up in the infectious disease registry and those hospitalized or at intensive care they are in specific registries for patient registries and, and intensive care and on the top then the few who are uh, unluckily losing their lives are reported in the death registry. And all of these uh, upper ones we are now combining in a specific registry for preparedness called Beret, which is the Norwegian name of preparedness. And this is a way of also trying to understand how we can uh, collide, collate and combine data from different sources to be able to model the epidemic and to also to be able to handle the uh, and, and giving good ways of, of giving advice into guidelines and, and so on. So this is the epidemic curve for Norway. As we've seen it, it's a bit tagged, but that's because we are not registering so many cases during the weekends. But we saw there was an abrupt rise in numbers in the mid of, uh, of March. And that's when we understood we now have a silent spread of the disease in the country. And we couldn't, up to then, we could almost trace everybody back to the source of the infection and find all the contacts. At that time, we were not able any longer. There were three or four or five cases which we couldn't trace. And we saw an abrupt spread in the society. And that's when our government decided to put in strong measures across the whole of society. I'll come back to that a little bit. And this lasted until like uh, end of, uh, of March, beginning of April. From there on, we've seen a steady decrease in numbers down to almost like a handful now every day in Norway. Um, so those are the, uh, the ones registered from, from March until, until May. 
And these are just the spread of the, uh, the numbers as seen on different age groups. And we see there are rather few children. And we know that those who are most severely affected are the elderly. And 90% uh, of the deaths in Norway have been with people above 70 years of age and with an average death rate of 82 years of age. And uh, there is a little bit of differences between male and female. I'll come a little bit back to that here. And these are the numbers of tests we've taken and the number of positive tests uh, indicated by the, by the blue line on, this, on the uh, side of the right side of the, uh, of the graph. We had around 5% positive on an average, and now much less than that, down to less uh, than 1% actually. And we've taken around 4,000 samples a day up to 250,000 samples now, and we have a big testing capacity that has been built up uh, in the society. Still, we don't know how many are, ha have had a disease without being tested. So the numbers of those in this uh, gray area of being uh, exposed and having gone through the disease without having symptoms is still unknown. And the Norwegian strategy has been mostly formulated in the same way as WHO to preserve health, avoid societal disruption and also to protect the economy. And from the 12th of March, that's when they actually the government took over. That's when they say this will be something affecting the whole of the society. This cannot be dealt only with the health authorities any longer. So that's when our Prime Minister Solberg said, we have to go in with massive measures. She was of course advised by uh, our Institute and the Directorate of Health and agreed that we should uh, do a lot of uh, actions and measures at the same time to primarily to prevent overburdening the health services when it comes to uh, treating patients and also to gain time to prepare at all levels of the society. So this is when they closed kindergartens and schools and induced the uh, stop of all big arrangements Still shops were open and even restaurants, but they have to keep two meters distance. So business was very poor and a lot of people actually closed down because of that. And then we saw this curve flattening out pretty fast, surprisingly fast, I would say. And the effect on the society, that was huge. And everybody understood this is serious. This is something affecting everybody. And then already from the 20th of April, we started a control uh, strategy instead of the knockdown strategy by gradual de-escalation of the measures and reopening of the society. And with a new policy, which was actually active testing, contact tracing each and every one and isolation and quarantine of people who were contacts. So that is the, for the time being, the strategy that is followed in Norway. At the same time, as we still want to say, we have to be prepared for a re-escalation of the spread either at local level or nationally. And then this reopening had like a stepwise and controlled way so that we could also measure and monitor if it starts reintroducing more spread. When we open the kindergarten first, two weeks later, we open for the lower grade school and then for the higher grade school to try and get people back to work as soon as possible while still keeping the social distancing measures and hygiene measures that can be dealt with without too much burden to, uh, to the society. And then, of course, there was this need also to protect the vulnerable, especially old people in nursing homes and people uh, in hospitals and so on. And then later on, coming to reopening of leisure and fun, like festivals and sports arrangements and, and uh, studios for training and exercise and so on. So we saw this was like a whole of society issue and it became like an all of society approach and with the whole of the government involved as well. And our minister has now formulated this from being a critical awareness phase that we have been into to try and get it, this into our daily routines. And we think we have to live with a lot of these measures for the rest of the year until we have a vaccine. And then hopefully also we have been able to do a little bit on the global level, working uh, strongly together with WHO and also in the EU and the Nordic collaboration for, for the sake of Norway. And then a few slides about the gender perspective because I was asked about that. And then we've seen uh, a lot of statistics here is uh, gender, have gender specific variables. And we've seen that more men than female are affected, more men die. And age is still the overarching factor, not, not sex and not underlying diseases either. And then when it comes to the leadership of the pandemic in Norway, it's like a fun fact that the prime minister is a female, the uh, minister for uh, preparedness and response is a female, the, min, the director of our institutes, Camilla Stoltenberg, she's a female, and at our department level, who is the one uh, coordinating the response, she's a female. This was uh, a talk to the uh, women in global health, so I had to bring that up. Of course, the Minister of Health is a male, 
and the director of health is a male. So probably this has nothing to do with, uh, with the situation. A few slides on the global situation. And I think uh, I'm running a bit fast because I saw uh, I have to leave you uh, at one o'clock, so I won't take too much of your time. The situation is uh, that the, this pandemic is spreading from one continent to another, starting in China, coming to Europe, now to the Americas. And we see you now most of the spread in South America and, and still in the US in some states. And we see a re-emergence of the spread in some parts of Asia, in India, for instance, as you said, and some of the uh, Southern East uh, Asian countries with a big population. So there is a, there is a pattern here. And I think also the measures have to re really be adjusted when it comes to what works in what kinds of settings. And we still see that Africa is pretty naive to it. And the question is, of course, will Africa suffer more when it comes there or will it suffer less? And I think maybe less because it's, uh, it's a country with less travel. It's a country with a much younger population. It's a country where uh, I think some of the measures taken in Europe will have very harmful effects if they were instituted in an African setting. So these are just the figures showing how the race has been and the going down in, in other continents of, of the world, uh, like uh, the other picture was also alluding to. So there are some equity perspectives when it comes to the global setting that preventive measures can actually disrupt economy for poor people totally, as also Taryn was mentioning. And you cannot work from home without electricity and a computer. And how can you keep hands clean when there is no water or no soap? So I think these must to be uh, ways of also leveling up and doing considerations related to what kind of measures work where. And without travel and trade, there is no food for the day. I think that's what we saw in South Africa when they were trying to close down Cape Town. People were not able to uh, get their daily uh, money for work or their daily uh, abil ability to go and do the necessary shopping or the market routines that they have to. And also, uh, for indigenous people, they seem to be very vulnerable. We've seen that from Brazil. And also when you have a health system where there are no tests available and no labs available and no hospitals with ventilators, you cannot rely on the same ways of, of actually closing down society as has been done in Europe. And I think it shows again that primary health care and universal health coverage, they are totally fundamental also for uh, combating the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are the basic services on the basic level of healthcare. And I think in Norway, we've been lucky to say that we still have a strong municipal health service with a municipal uh, medical officer responsible for infectious disease prevention and control in each and every 350 municipalities. And they are the ones responsible for the contact tracing and also for the infection prevention control at the nursing home. So uh, I've been asked, many times to compare with Sweden. And I think that is one of the comparison that is kind of fair in Sweden, this at the regional level. And, and also I think we need to have a very special attention to migrant and, and refugee health perspectives. Reminding you who are not working in global health every day that there is something called the international health regulations, which is the international health law. All WHO countries have approved that which is a law to try and prevent, control, and give response to international spread of the disease. And this is actually the law that WHO uses now to try and, and really coordinate and, uh, and find ways of uh, uh, handling the pandemic without unnecessary interference with traffic and trade. And I think it's totally catastrophic that, uh, that the biggest funder of WHO is now withdrawing its fund during the pandemic. And it's like uh, saying that, uh, yeah, what can you say? Taking out a fireman when there is fire. So uh, I think it's, it's very, very bad. And in this regulation, there is also an article 44 saying that all countries are actually obliged to support each other, to try and also do this in a global solidarity setting for both financially, for professional assistance, and now for this case in the identification of the source of the virus and to share also uh, the uh, lessons learned and so on. <clears throat> so this is a figure Teun and some have seen before. And this is back to more about the, how can we gather new information when there is lack of it? And when this epidemic started, nobody knew anything, I would say in human health about this coronavirus. We knew about a number of other coronaviruses, but this was kind of novel to the healthcare setting, even though it's been circulating in, uh, in bats for a while. And then we are down here at the bottom of the figure where we have almost no knowledge. 
And I think it's at that time extremely important that we've done our homework so that we don't start without any knowledge because we had knowledge about SARS, we had knowledge about MERS, and we had knowledge about uh, uh, pandemics from influenza, which was taking down our uh, areas of uncertainty a little bit, that we could actually increase the area of knowledge a bit from beginning. And then we have had to make risk assessment every week now to our government. We've had to come up with guidance on a one day basis, two day basis, one week basis, depending on the questions. And trying to increase this area of knowledge is of course very much time dependent and dependent on having the right abilities and tools to do that. And if you give us, this is just an illustration, if you give us a lot of time, like two years, we can probably come up with a proper Cochrane review. That has been the way the evidence-based movement have been dealing with some of these uh, normal therapeutic questions. And this has not been the, the situation here. And what we've been doing now in, in Norway is actually to try and help people get an overview over all the published literature. And we've done this through a live map of all published studies. And there is a huge, sorry, that was going a bit fast. There is a huge influx of new studies every day. So now we are coding them on a weekly basis and putting them in an open space for everybody to find, sorted after etiology, treatment, background, virology, and so on. So you'll find that on our website, uh, www.fhi.no. And, uh, and this is, uh, I think, very, very useful for anybody who wants to look up uh, the evidence. And what we've done as well is to try actually and work with an adapted methods for evidence-based medicine and doing super rapid reviews. And we've now been able to do, I think, like 10 reviews within the last two months, having people uh, then at our institute that ha have the experience of doing systematic reviews, working together with infectious disease specialists in our unit. And this has been a lucky combine and it's been very reviving and, and uh, I think, uh, accelerating also for the people at the, uh, the Institute here who have never wanted to give an advice before. They've just wanted to compile the evidence, but we have to give the advice at the end of it. And they have helped us actually doing all this review stuff. And these are examples of them. And here is a list and they are all published in English. So you can find them. So these are like examples of reviews that we have done about healthcare personnel using uh, face masks for primary prevention about the risk factors for severe disease. And that has even been done already in two updates because it's become so many new uh, studies already about using saliva spit instead of uh, going to the swab in the throat for testing, the role of children in transmission and also the transmission via contacts and droplets, case fatality rate and about the electronic follow-up of children working from home. So these are a wide variety of different things and also on aerosol generating procedures and the risk of airborne transmission. And finally on immunity of SARS-CoV and even with an update already. And in the pipeline also we have one on vulnerable groups, one on cell mediated immunity, one of cross reaction of immunity for other coronaviruses, the cold viruses, and also of the use of face masking community. And, and the question of face mask has been very interesting because we have the best reviewers of the world at our institute. Andy Oxman and Gunn Vist, they are sitting now doing rapid reviews together with us on face masks and the use of face masks in community. And we've seen now before we are publishing today or tomorrow that one, there has been a huge debate now between the environment at McMaster and in Finland and in Norway about understanding the evidence and how to interpret it. And we've actually been using here the evidence to decision framework and try to do that with the group of experts from my side and some others to evaluate the evidence. What are the values? What are the priorities? What are the considerations that we should take into to, to account here together with the evidence? So I think that has been also a huge lessons to learn from many of the infectious disease experts working together here. And we've published a paper already on the way we've been doing this rapid review in, in Eurosurveillance, rapid reviews for rapid decision-making during the coronavirus. So that's uh, something you can flick up later on with Atle Fretheim, Kjell, uh, Kjetil uh, Bruberg and myself uh, on the list. And then we've done one to show how have we been dealing with this when it comes to pediatric risk groups when reopening primary schools. So this is also a guideline done within a few weeks and now also published showing some of the questions that we have to deal with here, like pediatric conditions where children should still uh, be uh, encouraged to stay at home or go to school. 
for instance, evidence for the diabetes kids, the allergic kids, people with uh, epilepsy, they could go to schools. People with uh, diseases like uh, stem, stem cell transplantation or cancer with active chemo chemotherapy should still not go to school. So very practical and into really the day-to-day -day running of the, of the pandemic. And today's news, you probably have catched it already. There is this withdrawal of the study on, on the uh, uh, effect of, of uh, chloroquine and in the sample ongoing where they are testing these drugs with actually fake evidence in, in that study showing when you're also using a lot of unpeer-reviewed evidence, there's a huge danger that you also might pick up things that are not really well uh, enough uh, quality assured before it's published. And this was published in The Lancet and today withdrawn. So, so it's actually a reminder of the need also to scrutinize the, the evidence uh, thoroughly. And these guys, they say they've been working together to make the um, world healthy again. And they say in this chronicle that was published a week ago or two in Norway, we are all in this together, you know, and uh, this means uh, that uh, none of us are immune, maybe except those who've had the disease then, and none of us can beat the virus alone. We will not be safe until everyone is safe in all world cities and regions and, and so on. And in our interconnected world, the global health system is as strong as the weakest link. And I think this is really a reminder that also to protect ourselves, we have to protect others. And this is a kind of mutual combined uh, obligation that we have all of us. And uh, what about the future? Two more slides, uh, Tone. Uh, will there be a big autumn wave? That's many people have said so. I don't think so. I think we are hopefully at the scenario at the bottom here that we've had our first wave and we've seen now that we are able to uh, shut down this, stop this spread rather well by those drastic uh, intervention on societal level. And I think they can be reinstalled again at a local level since we are now having a testing ability and finding a way of finding and tracing each and every contact. So I think we will have small waves that can be actually closed down again at schools, at working places and so on with an intense regime of uh, testing, contact tracing and isolation. So that is the hope for the future. Uh, we don't know yet and there's still a lot, a lot of uncertainties. The virus might change and so on and so on. So some learning points. I think the principles of the, what we call the principles of preparedness in Norway, they still are kind of useful here. Having the responsibility for those who have it in peacetime, work as close uh, to the source as possible and do it in the same way as you normally do and with an obligation for everybody to collaborate. And then also this understanding that rapid access to updated evidence is extremely important to be able to guide the decision makers in this setting. So I think in a way it's a win for the evidence-based methodologies if they can adapt it in a proper way. And there's been a huge strength to our risk assessments that we have already been relying on the best evidence around the world, not only to what we have experienced in Norway. And we've seen that this is an all of healthcare approach and they have become an all of society approach. And I think we see that we are really in this world together here. And we have to deal with it also in a global international solidarity way. Many people have talked about disruptive technologies for, for years, and, and now we've seen a disruptive event of public health. And I think it has an opportunity actually to change society, which it has already done. And to me, it's been most striking to see that by political decisions, the whole society of Norway changed overnight. The way we live together, the way we work, the way we do things, the way we, for instance, now also use technologies to communicate. And I think that's also giving a hope for the future that there is power still in politics if it's done the right way. So the question remains, how can we live together in a globalized world without destroying the globe? And I think also when it comes to climate change and, and the uh, emissions of CO2 traveling and also the way of uh, intruding into habitats for, for animals and, and uh, species uh, is something that we have to rethink. And I think it gives hope for the future that more people can also find a different way of living in ecological balance with uh, both people and nature. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Fraude, for um, uh, combining uh, very hands-on, uh, intensive practical work with a larger vision for uh, uh, where this might be bringing us. Uh, that's wonderful. I know you have to leave quite soon, so I'd like to give space to one or two questions. Um, 
I thought maybe Fergus, you might want to think if you want to already raise something. And I also see there's a question specifically to you in the chat by someone slightly familiar to me. Um, whether you can tell us a bit more about the challenges uh, for the shift from people at their institute from compiling evidence to giving advice. Sort of those two, you said these two groups hmm. that have been the reviewers and the people giving the advice. Uh, what have some of those challenges been no, and how does it work? It's been a huge cultural challenge to combine these different roles within one institute. And that has taken four years. And I think they've been sitting on their kind of high, uh, kind of, uh, you see, high something. Uh, and, and being very kind of certain that we do the right thing. Now we've been like forced together. And, and it's been like, uh, I think, a really reviving period for the Institute for the last three months to work together across units that we, like we've never, never done before. And I think it shows also the potential that a crisis can be an opportunity here. And, and it's also giving a huge kind of... Uh, I think respect to the other side when you work together. That's that's wonderful to hear. We'll have to hear more about it. I'm also aware that uh, Fergus just chatted no question from me, so thanks for that. <laughs> I'm also aware that this is typically like all of this seems to be happening under time pressure. I know that our next speaker, Sitsa Wieringa, is just in a little break from doing his work. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Fiora, very much uh, for being with us, and I'd like to give the floor to Sitsa. Thank you. I'll listen in for another 10 minutes. Great. I'll mute. I hope I'm in now. Thank you. Thank you for that, Frode. I'm uh, going to try to start my PowerPoint presentation. And probably I have to share first, I guess. Yeah, share screen. Desktop. And, green. and then you I have to select your PowerPoint. Um, oh dear. Yes, you can. Can you email it to me in case we don't get it to work? Then I put it up. It should work now, I guess. Okay. Not yet. Okay. And then we have to go to Microsoft PowerPoint. Share. No, it's good. Yes, we're there. And then I'll. Does it work? Yeah. Very good. All yours. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to talk about, well, I have to think about 10 minutes or so about the clinical perspective on knowledge creation. So we're talking about a lot about so what guidance is, is doing, what knowledge we are we are having during the epidemic. Um, so I work on a on a uh, COVID cohort ward, which means it is a rapidly set up um, department uh, just to treat patients who came from ICU or from um, from A and A. Um, so that's kind of the middle category. People who are not yet on intubation, but they are too unwell um, to stay home, and, and they'll need some oxygen therapy. Um, and it was a very interesting learning scale because we really learned very rapidly. Um, just to give you some impression, so we started working with hospitalists, we started working with uh, surgeons who usually don't do any internal medicine or respiratory um, uh, care. And you start up that new department and you have to learn everything from scratch. Although, of course, you're also a bit of a doctor, so you do know a little bit of what you're doing, but condition completely new. And the first week, it looked like this. So we had an app group. And the whole day you would get all kinds of uh, webinars, updates, people making jokes. You would get uh, small screenshots, uh, photos, graphs, things were going on. Um, There's so much data and knowledge coming through. Well, none of this, of course, is frequentist data. It was all kind of, so uh, this is what's happening here. This is what's happening there. And I think the most impactful knowledge actually was learning from cases. So what were, colleague, what were colleagues uh, sharing with you um, about what they saw happening in Italy, what's, what was happening or should have happened in China, um, and getting into this whole mode where you're, um, where you're almost like inundated in this corona um, 
condition that you know nothing about and then you learn very rapidly via all kinds of connections to see what, what this condition could be while treating your patient. And a couple of very interesting things happened and I just want to discuss a couple of them just to explain what happened. So one of the first things obviously was about whether or not you should be using ibuprofen um, to uh, combat uh, fever. And you may be aware of this, uh, some people may have heard of that, but at a certain point we decided, well, we're not sure what happens with ibuprofen, well, maybe it is, it, is, um, <clears throat> it is a risk for people, and so just stick to paracetamol. And at that point, it was just hearsay. We didn't have any kind of um, idea whether it could be bad or not. We know now it's probably is not. But at that point, we didn't know. And the idea was, well, okay, so how do you go about something that you don't know? Um, and, and what do you do at this point? So one of those things that we thought about, of course, is that, well, paracetamol is a very safe drug. It's, it's, it's not very expensive either. So just stick to paracetamol for now. And that's perfectly fine. Just to go back to Tone's um, modes of reasoning. So this would be more kind of a precautionary kind of reasoning where you would say, well, okay, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're worried a little bit and there's a good alternative that doesn't seem very harmful. So let's stick to this. So that's what we did. And then there was this kind of reasoning going on because we know that or we learned that the virus was actually going um, in a cell through an, an ACE to a receptor. So that made all ACE inhibitors, and for people who are not clinical, but ACE inhibitors are your usual kind of antihypertensive drugs, um, quite uh, the suspect of whether they may or may not be of influence on getting um, COVID and getting complications. And I must say, it is very hard to see about that. So I, I saw a patient, 45 years old, and he was three weeks on ICU with Corona. And actually he didn't have any risk factors besides that he was using, uh, he was using Purinopril. And that makes you think a bit, okay, I don't know anything about that, but it does make sense. And it makes you think like, wait a minute, I've seen this happening. This must be the mechanism. So it must be the Purinopril that's, all, that's causing all this. We know that that's probably not the case. And also what happened, like at the point that at the point that we didn't know what to do, we actually still advise people to to use this because we were worried that if you not been using this, um, so lots of people with antihypertensive, they would stop using that. That would be more risking for a whole population than anything at all. So in the absence of knowledge or evidence or frequency data, there there was quite a kind of a different position taking. Uh, if you consider ibuprofen or you, uh, or, or um, um, ACE inhibitors. So in ibuprofen, we chose not to do it, but in ACE inhibitors, we choose to advise the people to take it because we were worried that, that they might get strokes and heart attacks. Now, another interesting thing that developed was that while we were treating patients, and I think we were two or three weeks in, Suddenly there was this notion like, hey, wait a minute, there, there's like an awful lot of patients who have um, pulmonary embolisms. And we didn't learn that from, it, from, uh, from China. That's actually data that came about. And it, this was frequentist data. And um, there were so many with people with pulmonary embolisms, like 25, 30% people had it, that it rapidly changed the way that we that we um, gave people heparin. So usually we would give them some kind of prophylaxis for PE. Um, but when we learned about this, when that came through, then suddenly within two days, everybody was put on like double doses of, um, uh, of prophylactic, uh, prophylaxis to avoid this kind of things of happening. Um, which was kind of interesting in a way because you saw it developing and then you look at the numbers and that was a kind of reason to, um, to, to change it. Um, another part of, of this kind of reasoning when you don't know what to do is for example, maybe people know this, but 
if you if you want to intubate somebody, that was kind of the highest risk there is in, in treating people with uh, corona, because that's actually when all the aerosols comes out. So you put the tubes in and then people start coughing and stuff like that, or you will have so much spread of the condition. So this was really like the dangerous procedure. Um, and the interesting part here is that there was all kinds of way um, where people were uh, giving advice on how to do this, how to do the intubation um, safely. And this, I think the most important part was that eventually you, ha you had to get it done. So this is more like means ends reasoning where you would have like scenario A, B, C, D, E, where you would like try any kind of step to get a, a, a tube in. Um, which is not a kind of reasoning, but it's solid because you need to get it done. And while we were doing all this, on the background, there were studies running, people included in, for remdesivir or hydroxychloroquine at the moment, um, which is kind of interesting because um, the people with remdesivir came in with their t-shirts with remdesivir and they're actually the personal name, like, hello, I'm from the Remdesivir study. You could contact them 24 hours a day um, uh, to include a patient. And that was contrasted with hydroxychloroquine, where there was no, no representative at all. Nobody came around uh, to show anything. Um, there were no, definitely no t-shirts or anything like that, but we still did both the studies. Um, and that was the how, how like, uh, a randomized controlled trial looked on, on the on the ground while we're doing all that other stuff all that other kind of reasoning all that other kind of clinical work and uh, this was going about and obviously we didn't have a conclusion was just we're waiting for those conclusions um going beyond that i think one of the most important things that we learned is that um a lot of the work we do is actually not based on randomized controlled trials, nor is it based on mechanistics, or is it based on um, the, uh, uh, the precautionary uh, principles. A lot of the things is actually about tinkering. So um, we did a lot of end of life care, where it's actually every day, every hour, sometimes you learn something new and you try to, to deal with that. So you try to do something and you have to be creative. So I treated the patient and like within a day, I thought I was kind of okay, but within a day he got, um, um, he got heart failure or he, he, his heart failure flared up and he had COPD which flared up. Um, and then so within a day he was really bad and we couldn't do anything and he wouldn't go to ICU. And at that point we were not allowed <clears throat> To use, uh, to use nebulizers because that would spread all the aerosols. So we had to use um, aero chambers, just inhalation um, to treat this uh, COPD, for example, which was devastating because if you, if you use an aero chamber, you can't use oxygen. So people, saturation, his saturation would go down while he was treated with the inhalation therapy, um, which is really, and he was struggling. And, and so we had to think of, uh, so what are we gonna do now? So, okay, so then there's for sure this option that you could use salbutamol in, um, in um, uh, um, injections, which is very unusual, because usually you would do that. If you would need to do that, you would bring a patient to ICU. But in this stage, we have to be creative and think about, yeah, but there is no ICU. He doesn't go to ICU, we can't nebulize. So what are we gonna do next? So there was, there's, there's no knowledge there. There's no evidence, there's no guidance there, but you have to make it up while you go and think about like, yeah, but we still need to treat them. So we have to find another solution. You should take them step by step. So this kind of gene caring was a very important way of dealing with the absence of randomized controlled trials and um, let's say proper guidance at that point. Um, what I'd, I'd like to say, uh, what I've learned actually from this whole experience is that um, guidance, when it's lacking, guidance is, is just part of a whole knowledge environment. Um, I did some research on mind lines, so the way you think, and there's so much other knowledge that's also important and that 
actually is as important as the guidance and the randomized control trials that have come about. Um, there's many kinds of reasoning that are very, very necessary. Um, and I think it's a really good thing about, really good time to think about. So what does guidance need to do? So in these kind of cases where it goes so quickly, um, what kind of knowledge structures, what kind of, uh, how could you help doctors while they're making this kind of very, very rapid uh, um, decisions with only, within only a few weeks of, of, of time? So that's about it. Thank you very much, uh, Sietze, for uh, taking us very directly to working with evidence, the lack of it, and all the other sources of knowledge you need uh, in the clinical encounter right there. Um, I want to uh, quickly move on, uh, also welcoming Beth Shaw, the chair of I Acknowledge. Thanks for joining as well. I know it's very early where you're at. Um, and I want to quickly move on to Tomres Cesaroglu from the Athena Institute about the guidance development in Turkey regarding COVID-19, especially at the policy end. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, let's see how I can share the slides. Is it working? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, and you have uh, something like, you, yeah, we're running a little bit late, so if you can yeah, I'll aim, keep it aim at 10 minutes would be great. Well, it was 15 minutes that we agreed, so uh, I'll see what I can do. So, um, well, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And also I'm quite excited because I've been through, going through a roller coaster in the past four months, I think. And I mean, since March, when the, the, thing bro uh, when the COVID thing broke out. And I'm, uh, this is the first time that I'm going to share all these in a, uh, in a structured way. Um, so I'm a f uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm a physician by training from Turkey. And uh, then I worked on health systems and policies uh, in a consultancy company in Istanbul, uh, uh, working, uh, serving to a large clientele, including World Bank, Ministry of Health, and, uh, and the UN agencies. Then I worked on establishment of a biotech company uh, in a science park in Ankara, working on personalized medicine and personalized healthcare. And in 2010, I moved to the Netherlands to academia. And since then, I've been academ in academia, currently in Freie Universiteit Amsterdam at Athena Institute. But I'm still affiliated with my and collaborating with my former uh, organization in Turkey, Gentest Institute. Uh, so, um, and um, I'm going to share with you our experiences uh, when it comes to policy making and also influencing the policy from a more external uh, point uh, in, in Turkey. Uh, and uh, I did this uh, with uh, Dr. Sadar Savash, um, uh, who, whom I have been working uh, since my graduation from medical school, actually. So uh, he's uh, been a very, he's a very prominent uh, physician and scientist uh, in Turkey and also an influential figure when it comes to health policy. He served in Ministry of Health uh, in uh, very uh, high positions in 80s and 90s. Uh, and then moved to WHO Europe, uh, where he uh, eventually became the director of program management. And uh, in 2000, he returned to Turkey, established uh, both a consultancy where I worked with him and also the Gentest Institute for Research and Development of, uh, and Clinical Practice for Personalized Prevention of Chronic Diseases. So um, he was mainly focusing on the last uh, bullet in the bottom until the, uh, the crisis broke up. Uh, uh, and uh, then when the COVID-19 outbreak in Turkey uh, came about in uh, February and March, there was quite a good control um, of uh, uh, preventing uh, the virus entering Turkey. So uh, it was, uh, Turkey was quite um, appreciated for all the things they have done uh, in a very good way. Uh, and um, so they, uh, they successfully delayed the first case where the virus was already um, uh, floating in, in Europe. Uh, but um, and in March already, the clinical diagnosis and treatment protocols uh, were successfully um, uh, developed and implemented. 
but there was a problem, which was uh, population-based measures that uh, aim to reduce transmission of the virus in the population. So historically in Turkey, uh, the uh, um, curative services and hospitals are very strong, whereas uh, uh, the public health measures, population-based, especially preventive measures, uh, it, again, historically, this is uh, the weakest point. And uh, we are as strong as our link, weakest link, uh, as uh, an earlier uh, uh, speaker said. So um, a scientific advisory board was formed already in February, but they included only clinicians. So 23 people, all of them clinicians, very good experts, top people in their area working on uh, and providing a, a, a guidance uh, to the Ministry of Health. But they focused mainly on uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, guidelines. And uh, there was only one public health uh, uh, professor in the board, uh, and uh, this continued until about May uh, uh, in this way. So um, Dr. Sardar Savash uh, saw that it was a, there was a clear problem with public health measures, clear problem with making uh, scenarios for the future, and uh, how uh, how uh, stringent the the the, uh, uh, the measures should be. And uh, he became very vocal in media with his recommendations on public health measures. So, uh, and uh, he started, uh, especially on individual and post population based measures, uh, such as contact tracing, quarantine, testing, isolation, which was extremely, uh, yeah, it which was quite weak. There were guidelines, but the field uh, was not effectively implementing it. And uh, lockdown came quite late. Uh, and uh, while it was implemented, uh, the, the low income and vulnerable groups uh, were, um, uh, were not initially safeguarded. And he was very, very vocal again on TV and social media about it. And uh, more recently, he was again very vocal about how to manage the, uh, per, the, the risk of individuals uh, when lifting up measures. So who can do what, who can travel and under which conditions or who can, uh, especially uh, uh, above 65 year old um, people and um, and also how the ministry should organize including the scientific advisory board in, uh, on uh, th this uh, outbreak and uh, after all and um, and and many uh, many other recommendations such as including the public health uh, uh, physicians and public health specialists uh, in the scientific advisory board and uh, many other uh, recommendations so um, uh, he effectively communicated this with the society and through or, or through TV. TVs liked him a lot and invited him, though uh, after a while mainstream didn't uh, like him so much because he was uh, becoming quite critical towards the uh, towards the current practices of the government. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, he, the, 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 that he was quite followed closely by the social uh, society. But also he knew how to convey messages effectively to, in the political context. So sometimes he was targeting, dear minister, please, these are the things that should be done. And sometimes he was uh, directly addressing, dear president, this is really important. We need to save lives. And so uh, he really knew how to effectively convey messages. And, um, and eventually most of his, uh, almost all of his recommendations were picked up and implemented, but with uh, about two weeks uh, lag time. So some of them one week, some of them uh, three weeks later, but eventually they were picked up and implemented. Uh, most of the time. So um, this is what was the in the front of the scene, but behind the scene, I mean, uh, we had very limited resources and it was a very small team. I was working with him in my attic in Zeist, which is a small town in the Netherlands. So continuous uh, online Zooms and working together. Uh, and the Gentist Institute team who uh, were uh, largely mobilized uh, towards this effort. Uh, and uh, working, of course, th this is all work done uh, without any funding. I mean, it's it's uh, the, the the institute funding it, uh, itself, the whole thing. And uh, also, uh, we had uh, very uh, nice uh, uh, researchers doing their inter uh, global health master internship uh, in Istanbul at that time, and they were also mobilized uh, towards this uh, area, especially Eliza Garten, who worked a lot uh, in finding data and uh, uh, resources. And uh, of course, there were 
communications with ad hoc experts on specific topics uh, behind the scenes. But uh, it was uh, it was really a, it turned out to be a crisis online crisis center doing all these uh, uh, together with very limited uh, resources and trying to uh, recommend public health measures and strategies, whole strategies uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, Turkish case. So, but again, these behind the scenes, we had very big challenges related to data and information because, um, I mean, uh, deriving clear recommendations is challenging due to lack of data and information and limited data and information. And th sometimes some of the questions are answered with data, but some of them not. And also there's a lot, there was a lot of wrong data and information, especially if you look back March and April, wrong data and information circulating in the internet. That's one of the parts. So, okay, evidence, data, and uh, what should be doing to develop guidance. But on the other hand, what is the situation in Turkey? Because uh, Turkish Ministry of Health has not been sharing the, the data on tests, cases, number of cases, number of tests in a transparent way. There was very limited data shared on a daily basis, how many tests, how many cases and so, but no epidemiological reporting of, the, of, uh, of various uh, different aspects. So we needed to constantly check this with our networks, physician networks, I mean both Sardar and I am physicians, so we had our own colleagues and networks triangulating data from different provinces in Turkey, uh, how um, uh, uh, how the picture is coming together, how things are practiced, if the guidelines that are made on uh, public health measures are effectively implemented with the provincial in the provincial level, and uh, and uh, so uh, trying to do all these fact checking uh, in the meanwhile as well. So an example to challenges that I want to bring up is about um, the modeling. So that was something that was criticized by some of the epidemiologists, some of the academics, uh, because uh, that uh, there is not enough uh, data to make decisions. There is not enough data to make models. Uh, uh, and one of the vocal people about this was uh, John Leonidas. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, a famous, um, uh, epidemiologist uh, you may all well know and he made a critic about it but then um, but, but I mean you can't tell a virus hold in a few months we'll produce quality evidence for interventions and then we're going to put it into practice you, you just can't say it that's not the reality in a policy context you need to act um, immediately and uh, and um, and I in, in, uh, rapidly and, uh, and this brings me to uh, a proverb that I like a lot. All models are essentially wrong, but some are useful. And uh, we need to use the useful ones, but also constantly triangulate it with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the reality, what could, um, uh, with the reality of, uh, of, of life and uh, check the, uh, if it fits, uh, and, uh, and then use also perhaps our uh, expert knowledge and intuition uh, on that end. Um, and uh, also, um, in, at that point, especially uh, Sardar's experience with uh, in uh, in uh, former roles in the Ministry of Health and WHO helped really a lot because he also experienced the pandemic in, uh, in uh, when he was in the WHO in in uh, in nineties uh, about HIV AIDS at that time. So uh, that was and uh, that was something that was quite useful. And uh, one of the, another strategy he employed a lot was to bring anything under the sun uh, together approach. So I, he calls it anything under the sun. So because I've been working with him for a long time when he says anything under the sun, uh, we get the message and organize and try to bring all data and information about a topic together, trying to make a big picture and mapping it with all what is known and what should be known and then see the big picture and also see the gaps in this uh, picture and then uh, try to uh, act accordingly. Um, and when we do such an exercise, data and information is not only white literature, but also WHO, ECDC guidelines, reports, new arts, news articles, tweets, and uh, communications with the field, with the physician uh, uh, and networks. And so everything becomes uh, data and information. And of course, remember that we are not Ministry of Health. So it sounds like a shadow ministry unit but it the the human resources are very limited so they needed to be used wisely and time efficiently um so uh, it was the 
but again, um, to see the big picture, with seeing the big picture, a lot of recommendations could uh, could be devised for the uh, Turkish um, uh, context, which uh, were uh, yeah successfully also implemented. And as I said, other uh, methods to overcome the challenges. One of them is triangulation, so checking it from multiple sources, uh, continuous checks for validity, internal checks also checks with previous uh, experiences, and there's also you call it gut feeling, call it seasoned experience or pattern recognition. I mean, recognizing patterns with earlier experiences, but there's also an element of intuition in such a policy making effort. Um, I have two examples. I will go not the first one, but the, perhaps a bit on the second one. Uh, from the early days in March, Sardar was in favor uh, of uh, wearing masks. And at that time, WHO was recommending against and many authorities, uh, CDC and many authorities were recommending against. And he, uh, but um, yeah, but he was quite in favor of it. Uh, and he meet an event. Maybe take the second. Because you were going to speak on this. Yeah, you, yeah, you were yeah. going to take the second, right? So yes, please yes. go to the second. Yeah. And then eventually, it, it turned out to be also something that was recommended later on with, when the uh, evidence accumulated. But at that time, there was not much evidence in the first place. And the second one is Lancet paper on hydroxychloroquine uh, for COVID-19. Just a very brief summary on what it was uh, for those who don't know. Oh, uh, I think, Tomris, I don't think we have time for the full case. Uh, yeah. But maybe you can just explain what happened with it in relate because I think many people will know the case. Okay, good. So, um, it, just to note that this study gave a lot of headlines like uh, hydroxychloroquine is harmful, clinical studies saying that, and uh, NIH, uh, one of the NIH directors said clear lack of efficacy of hydroxychloroquine. So very quick verdicts were given and uh, WHO didn't stop the trial, but it was put into headlines like WHO stopped or the trial. And so making big, big headlines and uh, as if there is a PR behind it in a way also. Uh, but um, before all the, the, the story unfolded, uh, Sardar said, I have a feeling, so we should check this paper. So I should note that we didn't go into the treatment uh, topic very much because it was, we handled very well with the scientific advisory board. We always worked on this uh, uh, health of public health measures. But he said, th there's something here, we should go about it. And it turned out that, as you may all know, there are serious problems with authorships, potential conflicts of interest, the, uh, and the uh, source of data, uh, the, the early treatment claims, no ethical assessment, and those who declare a quick verdict on hydroxychloroquine turned out to have been promoting another antiviral drug earlier, the remdesivir. So, uh, and uh, he was one of the, I think the, and he was, he became very vocal about it and he called the Ministry of Health to, um, uh, to continue using hydroxychloroquine that was in the, in the Turkish guidelines uh, from the beginning and seriously criticized the paper in open uh, media and, uh, and also in the social media and on all TVs. And eventually that accumulated and hundreds of scientists around the globe uh, be, has been uh, criticized and it turned out that, well, uh, the, the authors uh, retracted the data and uh, WHO saw no reason to discontinue the hydroxychloroquine arm of their trial. So, but then how does did his intuition work? Uh, I think, uh, and because that, uh, some of the reasons how his intuition One worked minute. was so that uh, it was used in medicine for almost 70 years and um, then uh, some of the autoimmune the disease people use it for a lifetime. It's extremely cheap and there's, but, but there's no big investment behind it. You heard the, uh, our clinician colleague who was saying remdesivir guys versus hydroxychloroquine. There's, there's no owner of it. And uh, there are um, antiviral drugs that are pushed. And so that gave him this uh, feeling, okay, there's something going wrong here and that we should be looking at it. And also hydroxychloroquine can be a, dis a threat to the health sector. I don't, we don't like to call it health sector because it's actually disease sector, the sector that is taking care of disease, not the health. And uh, that think of it with the hydroxychloroquine, uh, I'm sorry, with, with the COVID, the, their disease sector pie increased a lot. And uh, then it's, um, and if, if, if it is used, uh, and if, especially for prophylaxis, the pie can shrink, which is not beneficial for this sector. 
So my conclusion, uh, and the, so this is also one of the future things that we should yeah, be keeping an eye on. So the conclusion is that, yes. that if data and information is always imperfect, we should know how to deal with it. Thanks. And I think what your what your case very beautifully shows, of course, is this is a this is a slightly different setting uh, of guidance <laughs> development uh, than uh, Frodo reported from, uh, with not so much transparency around the information you needed. Uh, and I also think there's a striking connection between the tinkering that uh, Sitsa needed to do at the bedside and that uh, you and uh, your colleagues needed to do at the evidence side. I'd like to give the last few minutes to uh, uh, Fergus and I'd like to invite everyone else to paste any questions you have in the chat. And I think we're gonna have to return to them in a, in a future uh, webinar. So the last floor is for Fergus. Okay, well, thanks very much. I mean, it's been a fascinating um, hour and a half for me. I mean, I'm completely outside this, I'm retired. I was an oncologist, I'm no longer involved with guidelines. I'm still involved with Cochrane. But fundamentally, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool frequentist. I mean, I, I'm a great believer in randomized trials. I've led them. Um, but as a guideline developer, I've learned the limitations of the frequentist approach and of um, the randomized trials. What, I've come out very powerfully from these really interesting three very different presentations or presentations about different scenarios is that I think we still need the frequentist information. It, 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 is, it is the fundamental thing that makes the decisions, the important decisions, but you can't do, they, it doesn't give you, give you information in the time scale that's been needed for this. And so all, you know, Froda's presentation showing the way in which the Knowledge Center in Norway has devle developed guidance based on the best information they get hold of, they're doing systematic reviews, they're using the kind of intellectual technology of the EBM movement um, to develop the best evidence they can to inform decision making, and that's ultimately what's going on. And I think also that what Sietze described was this sort of, that the really, you know, he was at the sharp end, there was he dealing, wrestling with the problems, and it showed how, how we respond to that. We respond to that by the kind of making mechanistic, trying to understand things through the mechanistic um, um, analysis or just, as he said, just tinkering. But in the end, the, the evidence about whether chloroquine works, whether ibuprofen works or doesn't work, probably has to come from some kind of frequentist um, um, sort of experimental model or, or analysis of data. But at the, the other thing that, that, that both um, Tom Riss and Tietze have said to me and, and um, um, brought to some extent is that whole need to integrate knowledge at a very personal level and the importance of making decisions and the decision making is always difficult and that we have to bring to the table or to the clinic or to the ICU um, a whole host of different kinds of knowledge that inform the decisions that we make and a lot of the decisions we make will never be informed by the standard frequentist um, uh, sort of approach and that kind of melding of everything together which is something that we in aid knowledge are trying to do I think is is the important lessons that comes out of this from me and I I hope that these three presentations and the knowledge that comes out of them can form some kind of um, information that we can put into a, it can be put into a, some kind of paper that can go out there, the sort of learning experience from this pandemic. I hope that's made sense. Absolutely does, uh, Fergus. Many thanks, uh, many thanks to all of you for uh, joining. Um, I'm uh, gonna put up one question that came up it was mentioned in the uh, blurb for the announcement text how to balance harms benefits and efficiencies especially when already marginalized communities risk paying the highest price Frode spoke to that to some extent but if you feel like wow i really was hoping to hear so much more on specifically these kind of questions there's good news for you uh, on monday uh, there is a webinar uh, run by Barbara Regeer, hosted by Barbara Regeer, 
uh, on uh, about large effects at the margins. Uh, Barbara, would you like to say very briefly what you'll be doing there? Very briefly. So indeed, we are moving from COVID-19 and knowledge systems to societal effects for those groups of people that are already vulnerable and how this uh, pandemic and the measures taken have only made that more visible. But because this series is on the transdisciplinary responses to uh, COVID-19, we will definitely also explore how different actors in different countries, both the Netherlands and India, have responded from a civil society perspective and how collaboration with researchers and policymakers, a transdisciplinary approach, can even enhance uh, these efforts further. Excellent. So please all join. Yes, I look much forward to it. Uh, for now, uh, thank you all very much uh, for attending. And uh, yeah, the conversation is surely to be continued. And many thanks also for placing your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll be thinking within a knowledge also, and also that, you know, which questions can be taken up where. Thank you so much.